Welcome everyone from Regensburg, Germany to our third um, facelift webinar tonight. Uh, it seems like we have a very start, uh, strong showing tonight uh, with over 1,000 registered participants. And uh, I think we've also got a very strong faculty tonight um, um, participating. Uh, we'll uh, start in a minute uh, after I um, present you with a few introductory remarks. And of course, after I've uh, presented the faculty for you. Uh, my name is Holger Gassner. Uh, I'm talking to you from Regensburg, Germany. Um, uh, the top left uh, image is the Mayo Clinic where I did my residency training. Top right is the University of Washington where I did my uh, fellowship with Wayne Larrabee, Craig Murakami and Chris Mao. And then the two, um, two images on the bottom uh, are Regensburg, Germany and my surgery center. Uh, these are my um, my disclosures. Uh, I run a fellowship. I have two uh, full one-year fellows. Uh, currently, it's Francisco Ordenes and uh, Rita Nunes is uh, taking over from uh, Luis de Lange, who, uh, after 15 months with us and a great time, has just returned to South Africa. Uh, I acknowledge uh, Francisco for doing a lot of editing of the, of the video work uh, during this, for this webinar or for my personal presentation. The present series of live events, physical congresses and webinars um, started really 2018 with an initiative by Mark Constantian who started with dedicated meetings uh, for endonasal rhinoplasty in New York City and in, um, in Miami. And this uh, together with, with COVID really took off and we uh, you know, did these webinars that had uh, up to and over a thousand users. And uh, for almost four years, this has been now a pretty strong force um, with the core group uh, around Jan Tasman, Mark Constantian, Norman Pastoric, and myself. Um, the rhinoplasty webinars were kind of, you know, the, the stronghold, if you will, but then we had a very well uh, received um, webinar on facial paralysis with Kofi Boahin and uh, the two previous facelift uh, webinars. Um, we also have physical meetings and we've got the third European ski meeting coming up in Klosters is a really, really great meeting, not only socially, but also academically uh, with a lot of very good people. And the second European course in Indonesia rhinoplasty last year's course was uh, fully booked. We had Miguel Goncalves and other great faculty, um, life surgery and um, fresh frozen uh, lab dissections. Uh, two events that are coming up. I strongly encourage you to come to uh, to Washington DC for the international meeting in October and you'll be seeing uh, tonight's faculty there as well. And we've got the next endonasal rhinoplasty uh, webinar coming up October 16th and we were just talking about um, uh, peri-ocular uh, surgery webinar potentially November 13th. Before we start, uh, allow me to digress just briefly. Uh, this is really close to my heart, a project that um, Kofi and I have um, talked about during our early residency uh, days over 20 years ago at the Mayo Clinic. It was kind of this dream, this pie in the sky that we would, would build a hospital in Ghana to teach, train and serve the underprivileged. And uh, this is where we stand now. This is the building after uh, over 20 years of working together. Um, we've gone through you know, difficult times, as you can imagine, with COVID, with uh, inflation, with uh, scarcity of materials, with the war and such, and still, we are at this point where the roof is on the building and the, the windows are in, and we're now 
collecting money um, to essentially do the the ORs and the internal um, the internal equipment of the of the hospital. So if you can think of any donors, small and large, um, uh, we would greatly appreciate that. Well, um, why don't we go ahead and um, defer the remaining questions to the end of the session because we are a little bit over our time. Uh, mm -hmm. But again, Vito, that was just outstanding. Uh, thank you. And uh, so um, I'll go. I'll go next, and hopefully, I'll catch up a little bit um, for the time. Um, um, I think you can see my my slides. Okay, now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So, um, what I'm what I want to talk about, you know, all my work in terms of anatomy, in terms of uh, looking at facelift technique, is a lot uh, being motivated by by mentoring and teaching fellows. And, and uh, so also my papers are kind of toward, geared towards the younger generation um, in the hopes that, you know, some of the concepts that I never understood as a resident, I can potentially clear up a little bit better for the trainees. Uh, our goal is really, um, is, and, and we're focusing on the neck, uh, obviously in this webinar, um, is to get from here to here safely. And we've already heard a lot of very important concepts. Um, just to be aware, you can mess things up. This is uh, one of the revisions I saw not too long ago. And um, so really, if you if you consider all the concepts we've, we've talked about, I mean, um, almost every single aspect uh, has probably gone wrong here. There are numerous potential problems that we need to think about and prevent, especially as younger surgeons, um, not only the incomplete result and the inadequate result, but we also wanna think about avoiding the visible results, scarring, tissue injury, um, of skin, hair, and, and um, of course, nerves. And that's still, uh, at least in the younger gender generation, very, prevalent in terms of um, probably also limiting the, the extent of dissection and backing off, as Neil has mentioned. Um, we've talked about marginal mandibular paralysis and um, I totally agree, you know, the data out there are retrospective, there are um, self-reported and we probably live somewhere in the range between one to 20%, depending on, as Vito pointed out, how much, how much aggressive net, neck work you do. Um, but you're probably living somewhere in the single digit percent range. Um, there, are rare, there are rare publications that report more than 0% permanent, um, permanent paralysis and similar number, numbers for uh, cervical branch pseudo paralysis. Uh, pseudoparalysis uh, for the younger guys, again, it's a weakness of a dominant uh, cervical branch that results in ptosis of the lower lip, but aversion is still possible, while with true mand mandibular paralysis, uh, aversion is not uh, um, possible. Mechanisms of injury, I think most prevalent, uh, the way I think about it is shear injury, and that's a stretch from a spreading instrument, and that's probably um, within a dense fibrous tissue bed. And we see that for the frontal branch um, with our endoscopic techniques, and I believe we also do see it for the marge. Uh, thermal cautery for the more, more anterior aspects of the, uh, of the marge, and um, risk factors are neighboring vessels bleeding and um, poor visualization. Uh, transection uh, should be very infrequent and that's probably more a matter of training and experience. Uh, and the same is, um, would be uh, injury with the liposuction cannula that I can envision uh, in a revision case where potentially the marginal branch has been medialized by previous surgery. Um, my own numbers reflect, I think, that what's out there in the literature, um, single, single percentage uh, temporary, and I remember uh, each one, uh, you know, and, and it still costs, you know, it, it keeps me awake at night if, if there is a patient that has a temporary weakness. They've all res resolved within 48 hours. 
and um, and yes, I have changed things in my dissection, and uh, at least over the past year year and a quarter, I haven't seen any temporary um, weaknesses, and this may or may not have to do with what I'm showing you now. Uh, let me briefly go over over some of the technical aspects. Um, the incision is very much similar or, or the same like you've seen. Uh, I've changed from a trichophytic to a non-trichophytic incision along the hairline. Uh, that was at Andy's suggestion because he felt that the scars are uh, finer and thinner um, if, if you just do a perpendicular cut. And other than that, you know, I stay in the retro or post auricular sulcus, uh, stay high to hide the scar, and then do a curved incision and stay along the hairline. I don't cut into the hairline uh, anymore because that would just lateralize my hairline too significantly. The sub Q dissection, I agree. Um, the beginner's error is probably to stay too thin. And yeah, for just for filming purposes, I did my retraction here a little differently, but usually I have my, my left fourth finger on the back of my scissors or the knife. I am more of a scissors surgeon. Um, doesn't really matter. I think what matters is if you do sharp versus blunt dissection, I strongly favor sharp dissection. Again, I don't like the shear in injury also to the subdermal plexus with um, with um, spreading dissection. Extent of sub-Q elevation has become more significant over the years because the mobilization of the deep plane has become more significant. And also, and that's probably different from what um, others have uh, suggested, I've become a lot more aggressive uh, around the mandibulocutaneous ligament and the um, perimental area. And I believe it does make a difference in terms of um, completeness of your skin soft tissue envelope advancement uh, also in the mid phase. Um, the entry point we talked about, uh, it's the same line, um, really like what, what the previous speakers have shown. Um, I like to, to delineate it with my bipolar. And then what I do is, um, I um, give me a, a line uh, from um, the malar eminence down and about two and a half centimeters anterior to the gonial angle. I uh, identify the mesoteric fascia and the facial nerve branches. And this um, then allows pretty quick dissection along the mandibular tunnel of Men Mendelssohn and then um, I like to open that entire incision. Uh, it's what I call the unzip maneuver and uh, really open that broadly and then work on a broad front. And then, um, so this is facial nerve branches here. And once I've exposed my, my deep, uh, deep plane layer, then um, I actually like to turn into the neck. So what I do is I dissect a very wide uh, flap in the submandibular trigon, bluntly coming over the mandible from, from superiorly. And uh, it gives me, I think, a lot of very good exposure. You can identify uh, IJ and um, you can come all along the platysma, keep the platysma on the roof. And it gives you a very, a very wide dissection in the submental uh, submental area or the submandibular area. Um, so again, these these uh, adhesions here. Uh, the beginning surgeon may be worried about uh, facial nerve. It never is. Um, you you open that space uh, very widely, and um, then in the neck, really there are two limiters. Uh, medially, it's the interplatysmal adhesion and laterally it's the cervical retaining ligaments. And anything else you can widely, widely undermine and mobilize uh, in the submandibular trigon. Uh, and that's gonna set the stage uh, for me for my corset platysmoplasty. That's then gonna be very quick and uh, efficient address from laterally. So again, very wide undermining. Uh, all over here. Um, 
and this this shows these aspects uh, once more coming down the neck and then you really get restricted moving laterally and these are the these are the um, SCM attachments that we'll talk about a little later. Um, briefly zygomatic or cutaneous ligament there's one aspect that I may be doing a little differently here it is and um, what I actually like to do is I come from below and identify zygomaticus major first. And yes, you've got to be careful not to dive deep. Um, but if you don't, then the identification of the zygomatic cutaneous ligament becomes very easy because you identify the nerve and then come lateral and it leads you right into the ligament. And the ligament is a very dense solitary structure that you can really identify and transect. Um, this video shows then how powerful your mid-phase uh, advancement is and should be once you released the zygomatic cutaneous ligament and you've um, mobilized your mid-facial flap really all the way anteriorly to the nasolabial fold. Again, this is my the beginning of my of my submandibular of, of my um, yeah submandibular dissection, and here this is uh, how really significant. The mid face moves and then the entire skin soft tissue flap moves along with it. And that's what Neil alluded to. Your skin will follow and it'll bunch, especially in the temporal area. Now, this is one aspect that I want to talk about tonight, and that's my lateral dissection. I do things differently here. I elevate only the superficial fibrous layer of the SMAS uh, in the area around the gonial angle, and I leave the platysma down until I reach my submandibular uh, dissection and then pull everything lateral with this fibrous uh, flap only. And that's my suggestion for my fellows to keep an additional tissue layer over the gonial angle and the marginal mandibular branch laterally. And so this is, this is my lateral back cut um, and which then allows for very powerful lateral um, lateral advancement. Um, um, just the, just some aspects about, about um, anatomy. Um, let me give, give me just a second here uh, so I can jump uh, to the right to the right aspects here. Okay, so the segmental SMAS model. Um, this concept that, that I wrote about recently just kind of delineates which aspects of the SMAS adhere and which ones are not. And I think it greatly helps you in terms of understanding the ana anatomy of the facelift. Um, in principle, the SMAS, the deep layer where it's muscular and where there, there are no adhesions or ligaments is mobile. And the idea of full credit um, goes to Andy. And there was a talk, I think, 10 years ago when he talked about the uh, mobile versus the immobile um, segments of the SMAS. And we're all incorporating these ideas today. And I think that paper has just advanced these concepts and made them a little bit more more detailed. So in green are the, the segments of the of the SMAS that are mobile and, and have gliding planes. Uh, gray are adhesions, ligaments, and um, insertions. Um, the sternocleidomastoid segment of the SMAS um, is equivalent to the to the cervical retaining ligaments that Andy uh, described in his paper. And this is an intra-op dissection of a left um, of a left facelift, and uh, you see the fibrous layer of the SMAS, you see the platysma, which is the muscular layer of the SMAS, and then this is the old type of dissection that, that I did, which denuded the sternocleidomastoid muscle, and uh, also you're one layer closer to marge over the gonial angle. So strategies of protecting the marge. Um, Kofi, who is not only a great friend, but also a great mentor. And he took me by the hand during my residency and I essentially spent day and night, three years with him in the OR. 
So any question about the facial nerve, I call him. And that was one of his comments. Uh, two centimeter around the gonial angle is the danger zone. And you've got a, a various aspects. You've got the cervical retaining ligament. You've got the mesoterical cutaneous ligament. You've got the parotid adhesion. And you've got the platysmal auricular ligament. So there's a lot of um, zones of adherence in, uh, in this area. And that explains why the marsh is probably more prone to, to share injury. Um, when we're uh, thinking um, about the really the lateral third, this should be lateral third. Um, this is what I'm what I showed before. Um, it's uh, what I call a trilaminar flap dissection that makes it safer in the area of the gonial angle. So what I do is I um, for about three centimeters, I do only the superficial layer of this mass. And then um, the transition has already been made by my submandibular dissection from above. And it, it uh, through secondary uh, mechanism, if you will, the fibrous layer mobilizes the whole uh, medial aspect. So again, this illustrates it. Um, yellow is fibrous only, red is fibrous and muscular. And then um, the fibrous layer pulls the entire uh, uh, smears with it. Uh, so again, this is this is the dissection out here, and we leave the platysma down. And this yellow fibrous layer of the smears is very robust and allows for a very effective uh, vector. This shows it from from above. Um, here's our fibrous layer. This is lateral out here. And then we've got this transition where the platysma stays down lateral and then joins our flap. And the whole, uh, the whole construct then can very effectively be lateralized and, uh, and compresses your submaxillary glands and gives you the contour of the neck. The middle third, as I've shown you, is blunt dissection under direct vision, and there shouldn't be really much risk to the marge um, if you do that right. And then the anterior third, where I've become more aggressive, uh, I think you know a lot of it's just slow dissection and use your uh, probing bipolar stimulation uh, to make sure um, you're away from the nerve and do slow shops as a dissection. Uh, but I haven't seen uh, you know real problems in that area. And it's probably because I'm, you know, slow and, and careful. There is a perforator vessel close to the, uh, to the mandibular cutaneous ligament. So identify that early and, and cauterize that uh, relatively superficially. Just a couple of cases to, um, to sum things up. Um, this is this 60 year old female um, that I've shown previously, uh, exactly the technique I've shown, um, very thin face, uh, but effective corset platysmoplasty, no midline incision on her and uh, a trilaminar flap dissection. A 63 year old uh, female, uh, very similar, a little bit of a heavier face, but again, very good uh, structure. Uh, no midline approach, lateral trilaminar uh, flap dissection, and hopefully better delineation of her mandibular contour. This is a 60 year old female uh, bothered by her aged and wrinkled appearance. Again, extended deep plane face and neck lift, no midline cervical axis. She got stage CO2 fraxel, and she's got really redundant uh, skin soft tissue envelope, uh, very far. Uh, medial dissection of our deep plane uh, lift. You can see the buccal fat uh, emanating here and then um, very effective mobilization, a lot of skin redundancy. And uh, yes, you run into these problems up high in terms of bunching, but then again, you know, a favorable result. You never get rid of all these fine wrinkles in these hyper redundant skin soft tissue envelopes, but um, still effective rejuvenation. Um, this is a 54 year old female, similar anatomy, similar technique, again, trilaminar flap dissection. Uh, she saw, she came from Argentina, just sent me a nice note. And uh, uh, I think her sister is on the way to uh, get the same procedure. Um, 
maybe not perfect uh, uh, submaxillary gland management, but I rely on mostly compressing the area with my with my uh, platysma flap. And um, I think in terms of you know weighing risks and and benefits, this is what what's been very effective. For me, last case, uh, um, very nice female from uh, um, Arizona, I think. And uh, she just saw me not too long ago, eight weeks ago. And this is the image she sent me from a cruise that she did uh, through Europe before going back to the States. So I think, you know, managing the neck um, in conclusion, I think the trilaminar flap, uh, if you're worried about it, um, the gonial angle uh, with the dense tissue adhesions, the trilaminar flap works. It, um, at least in my hands, it seems to have eliminated the incidence of, of temporary marginal mandibular weakness. I don't think there's a, a significant downside. It's not slower. It's a pretty, pretty easy dissection. And maybe it gives the fellows a concept that gives them a little bit more, more confidence, um, possibly. Um, with that, I think I caught up a little bit uh, of the time. Um, if there are any, any comments from any of the faculty before we go on to the last, to the last talk, um, please go ahead. There's... Neil, Andy, any any thoughts? Yeah, I'm. You know, I'm. I'm interested. Do you find when you do your your modification in the with the uh, lower flap, do you find any restriction by leaving part of the 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 platysm attached, the way you do to this deep cervical fascia? Restrictions in in terms of leaving of mobility, of mobility of the flap at all. No. No, yeah. not at all. Um, the, the thing is, you you come forward until it joins that submandibular dissection, and yeah. you come so far forward. Yeah, as, yeah, as long as you get to the submandibular dissection, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you got to come forward with that flap yeah. until it transmits fully, and it always does. You just yeah. go for another centimeter, but then you really it pulls all the way. Yeah, yeah. I've had that. Ex I mean, I've had experiences where you know I'm not able or come to comfortably release some of the inferior stuff if I get a little bit out of plane or if I get, uh, or if it's a little too fibrous. And it is interesting because if you get, you know, I'd say about a centimeter, centimeter and a half below the mandibular line, you can still get good mobility. You know, I don't know that it's as, as, as much mobility for the lower platysma for sure. But in terms of creating that submandibular contour and line, you don't really need to release as much of the platysma, like you said. So I, I definitely agree with that. And, you know, sometimes if I go lower, you know, lower, there's no risk. Uh, I may, uh, in the inferior part, transition right submuscular and then, you know, have the superior uh, transition a little bit further medial. But mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very simple mechanical concept. Yeah. Can I bring up one point, Holger? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, we talk a lot about the marginal. But in deep neck work, the cervical is much more vulnerable. And um, it's, it, it's interesting because nobody's really paid attention to the distal aspects of the cervical. So it's, it's not necessarily easily mapped out in, uh, in, in anatomy. Uh, Jerry O'Daniel, who also you know, with Tim Martin does a lot of deep neck work, he quotes from his own patients, and he's incredibly experienced and trained, um, a 5 10 to 10% temporarily cervical injury. Yep. So we, fo we focus on the marginal, but the marginal is very lateral um, and you shouldn't affect the marginal, but it's easy to get to the cervical because it's crossing over the, right over the capsule of the anterior gland. And when I first started doing uh, deep neck work, I didn't really think of that. And when you're super platysmal and you're doing, let's say, quarter or something and you stimulate the platysma, you're stimulating a muscle fiber. When I was doing it subplatysmal, I saw something stimulated. I actually wasn't thinking that I could be stimulating the cervical. And it was the only time in my career I got a couple of cervical injuries that were temporary. And it was essentially uh, from that. And, and Andrew has pointed out how he makes sure the area doesn't get too hot. He cools it down because you're using cautery in the area. So I think I, I find personally that the this, this cervical 
um, is understated in understanding medially access deep neck surgery. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, because if you do it, if you, I use a suction monopolar cautery to do a lot of the fat contouring. Um, believe it or not, the bipolar heats the tissues up more than the suction monopolar cautery. Because if you palpate it with your finger, you'll actually feel it. And sometimes I get crazy and I'm sitting there contouring and then I'll be like, okay, hold on a second. And I put my finger in and I feel how hot it's getting and it almost burns your finger. <laughs> so you do, you do have to be really careful. And those distal branches, you know, cause some people, you know, they're close enough or they're just in the right, you know, when you're contouring that suppletismal fat, you'll see like the lips start jumping, you know, you have a, whoever's with you, your assistant, your fellow, you know, watching the face while you're cauterizing and you'll send some patients, you're pretty close. And all of a sudden their lip is like jumping everywhere and it's not the marge it's, it's cervical branches. There are, there's definitely a certain arborization of the cervical branches with uh, the marginal branches. And there's a paper that's going to be coming out in the HJ soon that I reviewed that looks at the arborization between all the different segments of the facial nerve. Um, but it's interesting because it's so high. I mean, in all, you know, traditionally people talk about this redundancy and the buccal and mid facial branches, but it actually exists throughout. And that's why, even if you get a pretty significant injury of a nerve, over a year, the other arborizing branches really take over distally. So, you know, even if you ding a marge pretty hard, you know, maybe not in four to six weeks, but over the course of six plus months, you'll get functionality. And what's interesting is, is people like Bob Akazizadeh who do selective neurolysis cases where he's mapping out the nerves and he's cutting the branches of the nerves. He has, you know, even with cutting, say, four nerves that go to the lower lip, he'll still have, you know, a pretty high rate of recurrence of synkinesis in those branches, even though he literally mapped them all out and cut them. So it is interesting because the system has a lot more plasticity and redundancy than we like to attribute to it, especially the marginal branch. Because, you know, traditionally we're taught like there's one branch that goes there and if you hit it, you're dead, <laughs> you know, but it's not coming back. It's actually not the case, you know? So anyway, because I've definitely had some cases especially medially, if you get into a bleed around the facial artery and you're cauterizing a lot, no matter what you do, you know, you're heating those tissues, you know, because those bleeders never go quickly or easily and you're banging at them forever, like 15, 20 minutes trying to get the goddamn thing to stop, you know, injecting it, doing all these things. And then, you know, you wind up getting a pretty significant injury. And even in those cases where, you know, you cook things pretty good because you had to, they still come back over time. Anyway, I know it's a very long drawn out answer. <laughs> Not at all. I think it's important and it's interesting. Uh, any other brief comments from, from you, Vito or, or Neil? No, I think I'm good. Neil, that was, that was excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any, any comments uh, from the faculty? Um, and I also encourage the participants to post questions in the Q&A section uh, if you want, uh, but um, any comments or questions from Vito or Andy? You'd have to activate your, your mic, uh, Vito or Andy. Can you hear me, Golger? We can hear you. Good to have you. Great. Yeah, obviously an amazing talk by Neil. Um, you know, I think that, you know, one of the things that is most difficult in the, tech, in the technique that Neil talked about, and he stressed it, and I think it's something you struggle with, especially on these very, very um, blousey faces, is that trying to manage the flap is the most difficult part of the operation. Once you, you know, are comfortable with the anatomy, the dissection actually goes quite quickly. It's ironing out all those problems that you get. Um, from moving so much soft tissue and skin redundancy, it becomes an issue because you can wind up with depressions, folds, you know, um, the soft tissue itself can, depending upon the patient's case, even though the flaps may be created well, can create irregularities. 
And we see that in all face lifting techniques, but because of the mass mobilization of the tissue that this, this technique creates, it's what can take more time than anything during the procedure. So I appreciate Neil highlighting that because like he said, I think we're so focused on the anatomy, the, fa you know, the facial nerves, the musculature and our fears about facial nerve weakness that we lose the, uh, the, more, com the more complex aspect of the surgery. So thank you, Neil, for pointing that out. The, um, there's a few questions from the audience. Uh, the first one from Minas Konstantinidis, uh, we may be able to defer. Um, he wanted us to um, comment on digastric uh, management and implications on neck outcomes. Um, uh, Andy, I think you'll be talking about that as well. No, I think it's, that's, that's Vito. I mean, I'm going to be talking about mostly a lateral approach. I think Vito's going to be talking about deep neck okay. work, right, Vito? So why yeah. don't we defer that uh, Minas's question um, till after the this next talk, which will be uh, Vito's talk. Uh, Rick Jaggi, um, do you always make a submental incision to raise the neck skin flap? Um, this one's for you, Neil. Yeah, so I think, and, and Andrew's talked about this. I, I think there's a... That maneuver I do where I lift the neck, um, I think that's very predictive as to whether you have to go into the direct neck or not. But you know, a lot of the things that I do are more strategizing from, from, from my purposes, the business aspect of my, my practice. So if I do this maneuver and the neck flattens out, I don't have to enter and uh, the mid uh, through a submental incision and I'll be correct probably 95% of the time. The problem is I'm not once. And it's just not worth it to me because bringing somebody back has a lot of layers to it that e even if the patient's fine, everybody's happy, the patient, you know, can I go out to lunch today? No, I'm getting more surgery. Why? I thought you had your face done. So more from almost a marketing point of view, I'm there already. I would just rather be uh, more conservative in treating those necks, uh, even though I, I think it's very predictive. And Andy's also talked about this, that... Um, um, you don't necessarily have to. Mm -hmm. William Scurry, I also find skin management at the temporal hairline challenging. Can you talk a little bit more about techniques settling all the bunching? Sure. Um, honestly, that's a talk in itself. Um, and that's why I showed that little short video. Yeah. It's in, it can get insanely complicated. What, what, um, and making it brief, because I know we have three other talks, um, I start to vector my flap I go from a, I'm starting with a relatively vertical vector, but as I start to get superior to the tragus, I start to angle my flap posterior. And that's why I want this fixation point under the temporal hair tuft. Because if you, the better you move the mid face, if you have a fixation point that's naked out there, you'll have a degree of bunching that will be very complicated to deal with because you have no place to make a horizontal limb to get rid of it. So this whole incision that I do is really just to grab that little bit of horizontal um, uh, 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 incision to get rid of it. And it gets complicated with relaxed skin tension lines. Uh, you can get an odd swoop if you don't do it right, but that's a talk in itself. So, but um, yeah, it, it is complicated. And I, and I think uh, that's something I, uh, that's what some of advanced deep plane facelifting is about is, is dealing with, the conundrum of the better of the lift, the more this becomes an issue. Directly, uh, but did the you know posterior angle of the mandible, and uh, she she got uh, a result that she was happy with. So thank you for listening. Um, this is a fun session. Thank you for having me as part of it. Thank you, Vito. Um, that was excellent. And there's a lot of lot of questions. Uh, we won't be able to address them all right away. Um, and maybe Neil and Vito, both of you can also take a look at those residual questions that we haven't quite uh, addressed or will address them after um, the next two talks. Um, some of them have also been uh, kind of, you know, uh, um, addressed, I think, in the later parts of the talks. Um, Minas um, has another question. When you do your posterior to anterior platysmal back cuts, does it meet your medial back cut so that you're creating a full myotomy of the platysma? 
And do you do anything to the inferior remaining platysma so that a gap is not created after your posterior lift, Vito? Yeah, so uh, I'll rarely do a full platysmal release in a patient who I'm not going back for specifically in a revision case for banding. That's, that's like, that's about the only time. So when, let's talk about the lateral cut. So I, I try to make a back cut so that I create one flap going along the uh, jawline that goes basically to Larray's fascia, which is the cervical fascia right at the level of the earlobe. And I think that helps me with a pull along the mandible, mandible that you know uh, makes the most out of the mandibular ligament release. Then there's a back cut. There, there's a back cut that's, uh, that's, that creates that flap that goes just under the angle, and that that flap. Um, I mean, sometimes th that'll go to the anagonial notch, and it incorporates the transposition flap. So when I lift the transposition flap, I'm pulling back, and then I use that flap to go forward. The, um, the thing is that when you pull on that flap, really what you're looking for, and, and uh, actually um, uh, this was last year when Andrew and I were in Nice, it was kind of an aha moment where uh, uh, a Dutch surgeon, I can't remember his name right now, um, you know, identified the CMAS, the cervical muscular aponeurotic system, which exists in that tissue we're pulling from the hyoid to the mastoid. And, and, and so in order to get a pull in that vector, sometimes you have to release it in other places. So I'll pull and I'll look that I'm actually caught inferiorly. So I'll make a back cut from lateral to medial, not from medial to lateral. That's, a, that's for a different purpose. And that will enable me to, to execute the vector right along the hyoid mastoid uh, line. And I think that that's, um, that that's one of the reasons I use it. The other reason, is just below where um, I'm attaching, you know, right sort of at the level of the thyroid cartilage. And it just enables that tissue to come up a little bit and it defines the cervical mental angle a little bit better. Um, but I, I don't do that too often, but I do it, you know, when I'm, when I'm feeling that I'm not getting what I want. Um, and sometimes even in those patients, I'll do a little bit of a hyoid fascial release with the uni, unipolar and that, that seems to define that angle a little better too. I think the hyoid fixation uh, is probably more important than the release, but a full release is only for someone who's got horrible platysmal banding. And I, I have a patient now that I'm going to do that to who had horrible platysmal banding at a young age from the precision TX, just got scarring in her platysma all the way across and it resulted in, in, in banding. Thank you for letting me run over a little bit. And I really appreciate the opportunity to... Uh to hang out with my the people that I respect the most in this field. Thank you very much. Andy, that was phenomenal and just so much, so much substance and so much experience. Um, uh, very impressive. Thank you. Neil, do you have any any comments? Yeah, a couple of just quick ones. So, you know. You know, we're often on our own islands, but the way we practice because we practice by ourselves, but it's so fascinating to see how a lot of us uh, come to similar conclusions. So um, uh, two point, well, I, the, the point about the submandibular gland, I, I agree hundred percent with Andrew. You know, a lot of times we lose focus on that the patient is much more concerned about process than the last 5% of a result. What I personally find is the incisions that's necessary to have the exposure to, um, you know, safely attack the submandibular gland. Um, whether uh, I do not like the incisions that are between the hyoid and the, it's they not. Heal, they, they don't heal they, horribly. They, they heal horribly, and they and another thing is they don't age well. So one of the faces from this this week I did was a revision, and she had that incision, and you know. We got to differentiate. Are we doing head and neck oncology or are we doing aesthetic surgery that you have to get somebody back in their life and within two weeks? Otherwise, none of their friends are going to book with you. So what I find is, is that we can produce such significant results and that the minor issues with, with, with the bulge, I, I find I, I would have a higher likelihood of somebody complaining about their incision length than they would for uh, a gland that was uh, 
not um, as adequately treated. So I, I tend to be conservative with the grand. I'm like Andrew. I do, you know, maybe you know five or six a year. Uh, but I have to when I once I tell the patient that instead of this little incision here, you're going to get a longer incision, et cetera, or you're going to have drains in your neck, or you have to sew the capsule, blah blah blah. Uh, Ninety percent of the time, they will just say, you know what, I don't care. And you're also producing a huge outcome. So you know they're looking at the forest, not always the trees. So uh, I'm in full 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 agreement with Andrew on that. And just one other comment, um, when I talk about a lateral entry point for the deep plane, it's not that I'm trying to access the deep plane here. What I'm doing is giving myself a fixation suture that I don't want under tension that's going to allow me to posteriorly anchor the flap under some sort of hair that I won't have the bunching issues superiorly. And I agree with Andrew either that the point of that is not to, incorporate, to enter the deep plane there. It's really to give you a fat cuff some soft tissue, because at that point, this is really not a tension point that you deep plane for me. My tension's all inferior, and as it's going superior, the flap is just going along with it. This is essentially a tacking suture. But gr great, great talk, Andrew. Great talk, Vito. Great talk, Holder. Awesome. Vito, I think, uh, I don't know if you can hear us. I know you've got a plane to yes. catch, and I greatly yeah, appreciate no, I can, it. I can hear you, and I, I do have a few comments. One is yeah. um, the... Uh, gonial uh, augmentation that Andrew's talking about is great. I, I you know, I, I've started doing more of that, and I think that that is really uh, worthwhile. Um, it's just a matter of mobilizing that flap. It actually makes the appearance that the angle is further back than it really is, and it's uh, it's actually really really nice. Um, and that was just a beautiful presentation, and then. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, if I'm doing a facelift and I have just a little bit of uh, submaxillary gland, I'm less likely to do something about it because I can compensate for it with the platysma or the lateral smash pull. But, uh, you know, in a, in a patient, in a young patient or a patient where I'm not, then it's all about contouring the subplatysmal contents. And so... It's a whole different situation. So yeah. uh, they are more apt to be more aggressive with the submax lines. Yeah, you you almost have to because if you're yeah. not doing anything to mobilize the posterior tissues, you're absolutely going to accentuate the visibility of the submandibular gland because you can't treat it. Which you know, which, right. you know, and a lot of people I know, like you, Vito, who do a lot of, you know, because I don't do that. I don't really operate on younger people who are looking for submandibular contouring. Um, but people who have big practices doing it, and I know there's a couple of guys throughout the country who do a shit ton of it, sorry for my language, they, they there's no way you can get away from it, you know, because it right. really it, it really would ruin the result. You would have a deformity that you'd be dealing with uh, post-operatively for sure. And, you know, none of us want to skeletonize these patients, but the reality is that when you have someone, a young patient who comes with a full neck, yeah. you do have to defat it. You do have to sort of take its volume down and when you do that, you uncover all these things. You know, they, they actually can become more apparent than they were prior to surgery. You know? Sure, so, for sure. And, uh, so that, I, and I do think that the, the SMAS, lateral SMAS pull with the proper back cuts uh, so that it's putting tension and, and really creating that hollow that you strive for, I, I do think it takes care of many more of the sub back stands that we would otherwise exercise. Yeah. Yeah. The one thing I find interesting and I, I'm curious to hear other people's opinion is that I do see a lot of patients who've had some some mandibular gland work done years ago. Um, and they're not necessarily even coming in for that part for that problem or discussing that um, some of them are. But the reality is, is that a six month result from a submandibular gland removal, if it's, you know, aggressive, is much different than one that it's a year or two years out because a lot of those necks can look very skeletonized and you have to be, in my mind, very conservative with the volume of the gland that you reduce. Um, and I think that's a learning curve because I think that Im immediately people get really excited about removing glands when they start doing it and they take away too much. And I definitely think, you know, people like uh, Dr. Auerswell down in, down in uh, Brazil He's now spending time rotating volume back into this the submandibular space and sub subplatysmal area, 
where he'll pedicle the subatismal fat, resect the digastrics and the submandibular glands, but then rotate fat back into that space to be able to prevent this deep V-neck that they call it or a skeletonized neck. And what I think is, is that that begs the question, why are you moving in the first place in some of those cases? It's sort of like before we started doing caudal septal extension grafts, people would whack the caudal septum, but then put a piece of cartilage in. It's like, if that's what you're doing, why are you taking it out in the first place? That, you know, right. yeah. So I think that, you know, obviously in, in all these cases, I think that um, it's like most things. Take less, because unfortunately, once you take away too much, you can't put it back. <laughs> right. So, but, you know, it's not to not take glands out, but if you're going to do that kind of work, you know, be, be more conservative with it because the deformities that it creates when people have too much subatismal contents removed, including subatismal fat, taking away too much subatismal fat makes you look horrible. I've done it on tons of patients where I've over-resected the intradigastric fat accidentally. Um, so, yeah. So it's really, you know, it's just like doing a rhinoplasty, right? You can, you don't want to whack the whole bridge away. You don't want to create, you know, like a, a ski slope nose. It's all about like refining your aesthetic sense. And I think that being a little more conservative in the subatismal space, not, not treating it, but treating it in a more metered way will definitely pay dividends for, for people who are starting to venture in that space. Just let me make one comment on that. So what Vito is differentiating is the person who's primary coming in for these neck fullnesses and why he's, why he's obligated. And I agree with you. And you definitely can create some, some sort of cobra deformity when you neglect um, something that's paramedian versus because the median area is really uh, easier, uh, essentially, yes. to treat. Uh, what I use as a guide is their frontal view picture. If they have a paramedian bulge in the frontal view and you only treat the medial area, yeah. they're going to complain. But if it's not in the frontal view and it's in the side view, even if it's a, if it's a gland that you and I or all of us would notice, they don't complain. The frontal view is the differentiating factor as to how aggressive I get uh, with the gland area. Yeah, which is makes sense because when they look at themselves in the mirror, they're looking at themselves straight on. They're not seeing themselves off. Anymore. So it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, very good. So, uh, tops, we had 1,047 participants tonight. Um, I am... I'm just floored and honored. Um, thank you. I, I, we, we have a number of questions still out there. Uh, I'll try to just, you know, type in and answer them uh, in the next uh, few minutes. Um, um, but other than that, um, you know, we've uh, kind of gone over our time a little bit just because it was so good and interesting. We're looking at November 13th um, at the next webinar. Um, I think Vito and, and uh, Neil uh, were okay with that. Andy, if you wanna check your calendar, it would probably be um, periorbital rejuvenation, uh, same format. Uh, so I hope you can join in. And uh, with that, thank you all so much uh, for your time. This has been just phenomenal. All right, Excellent. thank you. Have a good one. Timing was good. Yeah. I'm just at the airport right now. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Perfect, Vito. Have Great. a good flight. <laughs> thank and, you. Uh, I'll see you all in, in Washington soon. Yeah. Bye-bye. All, right. all right, Neil. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.